Hello everybody, my name is Reitse. Um, ek kan Afrikaans praat, my vrou is Afrikaans, so dit is die taal van liefde. Um, but I'm a, you know, Englishman, so I'm going to be doing this talk in English. If you want to ask questions in Afrikaans, feel free. Ek gaan maar daar deur probeer sikkel. Um, ja, ek praat vandag oor gender identity en jy, en miskien meer vir jylle jongers as van die ouwers. Um, ek hou van minions. So you're going to see them popping up every now and again. Probably like, you know, right there with the Mona Lisa. <laughs> so this is my family. Um, my wife, Miranda and Josh and Nathan. That's the posed picture. This is what it really looks like at our table. <laughs> my wife hasn't seen this photo yet. She doesn't know that I put it out here. I've told my son. He's very interested in that. All right, so I'm a medical doctor. I have specialized in anesthesia, narcosa. It means I put people to sleep for a living. If you find that you're getting dozy or your buddy next to you is sleeping, that's me, just give them a knock. I have done a lot of research and I've specialized in looking at the evidence base behind science. How do we know that what we say is true is true? I've done a master's in health research methodology in Canada. I've done my PhD and I'm currently busy with a master's in philosophy and Christian apologetics. The research component of what I do is big. And as I've said, a big component of that is focusing on research evidence and research quality. About a third to half of what I've done is around that. And I'm speaking from that framework today. How do we evaluate the evidence? How do we know that what we know is good or real or right? I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a child psychiatrist. I do not treat people with psychiatric diseases, nor have I, nor will I be doing so. I'm not giving you clinical advice. Please make sure that you understand that. It's important that I'm speaking in my own personal capacity, not as a representative of any organization. Um, I speak as a medical expert in my field of medical evidence assessment, not as a psychiatrist. And I am acting out my right to speak in a public sphere um, and to have a discussion, which I think is important. You know why I have to say this stuff. All right. So this is about you. How do you fit into this thing? And again, maybe more for your kids, or for you oaks. How do you fit in here? I want to first ask the question, what are you? Not who are you. What are you? Come on. You man. Yeah. What is this? No, it's a picture of a hammer. <laughs> yeah, it's a hammer. What does a hammer do? A hammer, hammers, yeah. Its purpose of the hammer is to hammer things. That's why we call it a hammer. That's what it does. What is a good hammer? Oh, that's the uh, controlling the hammer. <laughs> what is a good hammer? It's a hammer that hammers well, you know? It, you, know, you hit the thing and it does what it does and it drives the nail into the space. Is this a good hammer? <laughs> you need to do woodwork. <laughs> that doesn't do the purpose of what a hammer is supposed to do. How should you use a hammer for the purpose for which it was designed to hammer stuff? Generally a bad idea to try and open a glass of wine or a bottle of wine with a hammer. You can do it. If you look on YouTube, there's pretty cool things. But if you use the hammer wrong, that's not a good use of the hammer. But this is the type of thing we do with my son, who's six. He says, what is it, and what do you use it for? What is it, what do you use it for? Vacuum cleaner, vacuums. Umbrella, protects you from the sun. An ax, it chops. By understanding what a thing is, you can understand what the good is. To know what is good for something, you must know what it is. You must understand the nature of the thing. So what are you? And you guys have all said to me that you're a human being. So what is this thing that we are? Where do you come from? What is the core of this? This is my pen over here. It's a really important pen for me because when I, I do ICU, a lot of ICU care, so I spent a huge chunk of my life looking after COVID patients. And just as COVID starts, I got this pen. Now, doctors lose their pen on a regular basis. 
but I've kept this pen for me for, with me for two years. And every time I look at it, it reminds me of what we did through COVID, the people that died. It has a lot of value for me. I want to ask, where do we get worth from? Where do you get your value from? We often talk about humans having value. Where does that value come from? On the left, my dad. On the right, my son, when we adopted him. My dad can't see as well as I can. My son can't run as fast as me. So that makes them less valuable than me. Is that true? No, of course it's not. Because we've got value that's intrinsic, not linked to what you can do, but just from who you are. In fact, I sometimes think that that little dude on the right has got a lot more value than me. God made you. For, for I created you in my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. We are created by God. I do a talk on evolution and creation. God created us. The creator endowed us with value. And you are valuable whether you can walk or not, whether you are bald or not, whether you are small or old. You have intrinsic value. And the value that you get is from God because he is the one that created you. This pen is valueless to you. Maybe you like the color. It's copper. It has huge value to me because it's mine. Imagine what God feels about your value that he created you and you reflect his image in you. You are also whole. You are created as an entity that is human, that has mind, that has body, that has spirit. You are not running around as a spirit in your shell of a body. You are entwined in your body. That is what we are. Humans are a mixture of this stuff. That is what it means to be human, a combination of all of these things together. And God has created you to have a relationship with him and a relationships with one another. That's how it goes. That's what friendship's about. That's what marriage is about, that relationship with each other. And when you follow the instructions on God on how to live this life in the rules, you have an awesome life. What I mean by that is it is a life that is full of relationship, of love, of children, of just familiness and goodness and wholeness. There's no BMWs in that promise. It's just if you do the stuff right and you use people or you do people in the way that they are designed to be done you get fullness and growth and happiness. You get a full, rich, thick life. That's the intro. So one of the most important relationships that we engage in with one another as humans is the relationship between a wife and a husband. And that is a representation of the relationship between Christ and the church. It's not that, we, that the, ch uh, the church and Christ represent us. We have a marriage because that's how it works. That's how God has the relationship. And linked intimately into that is sex. Like it's, it follows, but it's supposed to be done within that relationship. Sex must occur between a husband and a wife. Sex is good. You must have lots of it. In the relationship of a marriage, it creates pleasure it brings intimacy, and it leads to children. And let me tell you, if I have one big regret in my life is that my wife and I didn't have children earlier because of the joy and the fullness and the absolute coolness of having kids. It's just amazing. In our country, sorry, in our world, biological sex is how animals procreate, how humans procreate, how lizards procreate. There are two biological sexes, and it is linked to the reproductive function. The reason that there are two is that you need the one and you need the other. And the one gives an egg, and the other one gives sperm, and they come together, and there's a new life. And it's as simple as that. So next time you hear somebody at a, a school or a university tell you that there aren't two sexes, the whole foundation of sex is linked to this concept of reproduction. It's so basic that it's never referenced in research articles. It just is a fact of life. And in humans, you have male and female, and XX is a female, and if you carry the Y chromosome, you're a male. 
and you need one of both to have offspring, to have kids. So what's the problem? What's going on? Why am I here? Why is there so much anxiety about this issue? What's driving this? And the problem is that we're in a culture that has changed. You've said things have changed. Things are different. What's going on? Who are we? How do we fit together? And it's the culture that's busy driving it. So as we start, I want to say a few things up front. First, words are not violence. So when I speak something, we used to say, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now it seems as though words said are violent. Words are not violent, and disagreement is not hate. This is how we engage with one another, and I can respect you and see the image of God in you, but still disagree with the thoughts that you hold. If you can't do that, you can't engage in a society. The second statement is that gender is anchored in biology. It's not a social construct. And third, a man cannot become a woman. A trans woman remains a biological man. And a woman cannot become a man. A trans man remains a biological woman. I'm going to unpack this a little bit. I'm going to talk about the gender issue and what are the definitions that underpin this. So women have got feminine characteristics. Think of a stereotypical woman. Long hair, wearing a dress, high heels. Men have masculine characteristics. Think of a stereotypical man, me. I'm wearing the chinos, South African uniform. You know, I've got the shirt on, I rolled it up, I'm wearing the Garmin watch. I am the stereotypical man. These things are anchored in biology. They orientate out of biology, but they are culturally expressed differently. How many of you girls are wearing a skirt? One or two, anybody? But we all know that they're girls. And what happens when you go to... Scotland, and the guys are walking around in a skirt, what's that? It's a kilt. Cold. <laughs> cold. <laughs> Very cold. So the cultural expression of what is male and what is female differs in different cultures. But it's pretty clear that it is a man or a woman who's dressing in those different cultures. Your gender identity is how you feel about my gender. I feel female. I feel male, I don't feel either. I don't fit into any of those categories. And my gender as expression is how I choose to express it to the rest of the population. So I have dressed in this way to reflect my South African instructions for malehood. If I wore a skirt and a blouse, you would see that I was expressing a female gender. I'm choosing to express a female gender into the community. But the categories in which it happens are always in male, or female categories, or none. You can't escape the fact that the origin of all of this lies in the biology of it. If you go to university, or if you go to a state school and you do comprehensive sexual education, you are taught that gender is a social construct. Gender is not a social construct. That it comes out of uh, a guy called Money from 1960 who attempted to differentiate between sex and gender. Up until then, in all our medical documents, it says gender, and what we mean by that is biological sex. Gender is anchored in biology. Across all cultures in the world, there is a male and a female because that underpins the biological reality of reproduction. Gender expression differs. And trying to separate gender from sex, from biological sex, is trying to separate the waves from the ocean. You just can't do it. They are deeply interlinked with one another. Do all women fulfill all the categories of feminine? Does it mean if you don't fulfill some of these categories, you're not a woman? Do I fulfill all the categories of manness, of maleness? No, none of us do. And those are generalizations. But does that mean that there are no feminine or, ma feminine or male characteristics? No, it doesn't. What does a dog look like? Four legs, tail, it's got ears, and fur. Here's a dog with three legs. Is it still a dog? Here's a dog without fur, is it still a dog? There's a dog without a tail. So we can look at something and say we can abstract a concept of this is a male on average, this is a female on average. And that is how it works in our culture. This is how we understand what it is. Now, as you grow up, in my own experience is when I went through high school, I'm quite tall. I was just arms and legs and pimples and hair down to here, and it's pretty greasy. I didn't feel cool. 
I didn't feel suave. I wasn't in the cool group kids. I was a little bit of a nerd. I could run a little bit. I didn't fit in. I felt really uncomfortable in my own skin. What am I? Who am I? How do I fit in here? Because you don't feel comfortable in your skin while particularly going through puberty does not make you gender dysphoric. It's just called puberty. It is a normal part of growing up. Puberty in adolescence is a process in which both your body goes through development, but psychologically you start to understand who am I. So you're living with your parents and you have got their values, but you are going to establish your own values. And so it is a time of confusion. It's understanding where you are comfortable. And we have got these stereotypes of male and female, but there's a huge range on how you wish to express yourself. Women don't have to wear short hair or long hair, or you can change it any color. Just because it's supposed to look like this doesn't mean that, that it must look like that. And there's a wide range of expression. There is freedom in expression. It doesn't change, though, who you are, your core biological identity. Now, in some people, they're not going through a normal adolescence. Your body, and particularly your mind, will respond to what's happening in, you, or in your environment. So some people will not fit in to the classic environment because they are same-sex attracted. So they're attracted to somebody of the same sex. And all the other boys are saying this about the girls, and you don't fit in, so you feel you don't fit in. That's not gender dysphoria. Some people are going to have depression, going to have anxiety disorders. Some people have got... Um, are, will go through a period of abuse or severe trauma in their family. And how do you respond to that? One of the most common ways of responding to that, particularly in young children, is to come out and say, I don't know who I am. It is a well-established fact in the psychiatric journals that it is dangerous to start to deal with a child just around their gender dysphoria, particularly when there's issues like trauma or abuse or autism on top of that. You are not a gender dysphoric person. You are a person with a wide range of, of emotions, of, of issues that you need to deal with. So when you start feeling these things and you start having these questions about who I am, am I, that does not equate to gender dysphoria. That equates to living through with life, the difficulties of it. And within that group, some people will have true gender dysphoria. The incidence of that is 1 in 20 to 1 in 50,000. It is most likely that if you experience these thoughts that you do not have gender dysphoria. The culture has made it in such a point that when you start asking a question about who I am, the answer is you must be gender dysphoric. And the solution is a treatment process. But that takes what is being human and growing up and medicalizing it and turning it into something. Are there people with gender dysphoria? Undoubtedly. Is the diagnosis of them in the past being underdiagnosed? Undoubtedly. So there are those people that are struggling. And if you are struggling with it, then it's not going to be something that you're easily going to outgrow. But for the majority of people, this is not gender dysphoria. And what's happened in our culture is that we're going through this phase where the things that we know are so are being said that we don't know this at all. And it's a time in which the very elements of what we call common decency just are being questioned at their core. So it is dangerous for me to say that a man cannot become a woman and a woman cannot become a man. And I must explain to my son that I'm going to go and talk about this issue who's six years old, who knows that he's a boy, but that there's so much cultural confusion that it's causing this type of pressure on him. I'm going to give a short over summary of the gender dysphoria issues. I'm going to unpack this in much more detail tomorrow. And if you haven't registered for the conference yet, Garth's going to be at the desk and you can register there. Right? When we talk about gender dysphoria, you've got to think carefully that there are different categories under it. We tend to lump it all together into one. These things are not all the same. The first category is called intersex. This is a biological condition in which you inherit abnormally the genes, the sex genes from your parents. 
So if you're XX, you're a girl. If you're XY, you're a boy. But you can have three X chromosomes. It's called trisomy X. You can miss one of the X chromosomes, so you can have an XO. You can have two X chromosomes and one Y chromosome. It's like Down syndrome. Trisomy means 3, 21. It means I've got three chromosomes. And they are physiological categories with changes that we can define. Trisomy X, Turner syndrome, wide carrying angle, broad shield-like chest, short stature, webbed neck. It's a genetic abnormality. Disorder of sexual development is what we call it, or we used to call it intersex. This is a medical condition, and you're born with a genetic pattern. We can take your cells and split them out and look and see what's happening on it. There are two categories. One is genetic, where the instructions for making sex hormones are mixed up. Or you can have normal sex hormones, the chromosomes, but you don't respond to the hormones as they're being made in your body. So you don't respond to testosterone. If, you don't, if you're not exposed to testosterone, you will develop as a girl. You will be born looking like a girl. And then when you start to grow up and your testes, because you will have testes, start to make more testosterone, you grow bigger and stronger and faster. And when you run, you win. And so you have the whole intersex discussion. Often when people think about transgender issues, they think about this. This is not the same as transgender issues. The second category is what's called persistent gender dysphoria. This is a well-understood medical condition. Before 1980, 1990, the incidence is more common in men. It's 1 in 20,000 to 3 in 20,000. And in women, 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 30,000. Before the cultural impact, this is the rate at which we diagnosed these conditions. It is a debilitating unease and difference between the biological sex and my understanding of my, of my gender. And it's strongly associated with depression, suicide, difficulty in holding a job. And it's there all the time from as long as you can remember. From the youngest time that you can remember, it has always been there. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's this category. Look at the incidence of it. Gender dysphoria in childhood does not inevitably persist into adulthood. Out of 100 children who come to a child psychiatrist or psychologist because they're having gender dysphoric issues, 60 of them to 80 of them, by the time they hit puberty, the dysphoria is gone. So more, 8 out of 10, 6 out of 10, they will no longer have the dysphoria by the time they hit their, they hit their puberty. And this data is current coming out of the Dutch groups in, in Europe, which are, do a lot of this type of research. You cannot predict who will desist, stop being gender dysphoric, and who will persist. And in the people that present with gender dysphoria, high incidences of autism, of same-sex attraction. They don't fit into the normal categories, the classic categories, and so you feel uncomfortable, and so you feel uncomfortable with your gender. People with autism have very rigid ways of understanding. Men must wear uh, long pants. I don't like wearing long pants. I can't be a man. And so they've got dysphoria about it. The last category is the category that's driving a lot of this discussion. And it's called rapid onset gender dysphoria. There's a lot of argumentation around this term, but I think it captures what's happening. This happens most prominently in young adolescent girls between the ages of 14 and 18. And it happens in female to male clusters. In the past, it's been boys, men, who've come out with gender dysphoria on their own. Now you have groups of girls in this age group, which is the prime moment of um, adolescence. No prior history of gender dysphoria. They're not gender dysphoric like a persistent gender dysphoria that's been there all the time. Something happens all of a sudden where they come out. It has the features of a craze. So it will happen somewhere in a school, and it's like this ripple that comes out and spreads out at the moment it's happening across South Africa. It has a high social value action in today's society. So if I am, as I was as a child, ungangly, and I've got pimples, and I'm all over, and I'm at the bottom of the food chain in the school, 
and I now come out as transgender, all of a sudden, I move up in the thing, and people start looking at me, and they post stuff from Instagram about me, and I'm brave, and you know, I have a purpose, and all of a sudden, this stuff makes sense to me. It is common in adolescents that have got depression, anxiety, often associated with eating disorders, cutting as well. That type of cluster of events is often associated with these children coming out of this. And it is strongly driven by social media influence. There are rules on the internet. First one is, if you think you're trans, you are trans. The second one is, nobody else cares about you except your trans community online. You need to, here's the story to tell to your parents. This is how you get the doctors to, to prescribe you testosterone. Once you get the testosterone, life is going to be good. If you Google or come into any of the groups, Tumblr, if you go into Reddit forums, and you start asking questions about this, the answer is you are trans. Doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what happened in your family, doesn't matter about your anxiety issues or your depression issues. This is what, and then around you in the school, then you'll see other children coming out as non-binary or having this ripple explosion that's happening in, in, the, in the school, in the community. That is accelerated or follows on woke movements, very strongly associated with that, or aggressive social activism that happens in the community or at a school. And the interesting, a lot of these children are rejecting the need for dysphoria. Why do I need to feel uncomfortable? If I want to change sex, why can't I just change sex? So you're called transmed. The Dutch guys who pioneered this, this is uh, Steensma, he writes, we don't know where the studies we have done in the past can still be applied to this time. Many more children are registering and also a different type. One in 50,000 to one in 1,000 in some schools, one in 200 are coming out. He's saying, what's going on here? Suddenly, there are many more girls who feel like they're a boy. Well, the ratio was the same in 2013. So before 2013, much more boys than girls. 2013, as many boys than girls. Now, there are significantly more girls who register, three times as many girls who register compared to children who were born as boys. Something has changed. This has the features of a social contagion. This is the graphs from referrals to the Tavistock Gender Clinic in the UK over a period of time. Look what happens. It goes up 2019, and here they start to, the lawsuits are coming out. Young girls have said, you transitioned me inappropriately. I'm 21, I'm infertile, I've had surgery. What the heck are you doing? There's currently a lawsuit in which they're talking about a, hundred, a thousand children, families, bringing a class action lawsuit against the NHS. But look what's happened all of a sudden. The numbers have started to drop. In Finland and Sweden, which are proceeding, they've been on the front of the curve. Look where their numbers are now. As the reports have started coming out of children that are detransitioning, as the warnings have come out around the lack of understanding on what we're doing, the numbers have started to come down. This has the features of a craze. Abigail Schreier writes a really difficult book to read. It's called uh, Irreversible Damage, the transgender craze that is seducing our daughters. And the problem with this is, in the past, if you shot an I used to, you know, when we were at school, you shoot an earring into your ear, you get a tattoo. Now there's medical intervention that's waiting for you with significant long-term consequences. These three are not the same. You must realize this. The categories of intersex is not the same as persistent gender dysphoria, and it is not the same as rapid onset gender dysphoria, or what we're seeing in this young female population. All right. Summary. This is where everybody perks up. There'll be class tests at the end of this piece. Take notes. You are created by God. You are valuable. Doesn't matter what you can do, what you can't do. His image is in you. He loves you. He has created you. Like I value my pen, so God looks at you and holds you in his hand and loves you. You are whole. You are an integrated whole body, mind, soul. You are one thing. You're not in a body that can be malleably changed and manipulated. These three things are not the same. 
Intersex is not persistent gender dysphoria, and this entity of rapid onset is something different, as recognized by the Dutch, who have pioneered this stuff in gender dysphorics. The research is not the same. And I've done a lot of research in anesthetics. We do about 12 million operations worldwide in anesthesia. There's masses and masses of data around research. There's a lot that I have no idea about, that we don't understand. The data sets out of the Dutch gender clinics are based on between 70 and 30 children per study. The biggest study that I've done around the use of beta blockers in patients has been 10,000, and we're still not 100% sure about the study. The entire group that's driving this stuff is coming out of this group over here, persistent gender dysphorics, in predominantly males, in a totally different demographic than what we're seeing here. And Stiensma, who read this stuff, said, we don't know if this data is appropriate. And scientifically, it's not. And to pretend that these are the same is to be disingenuous about what we truly know. You need to have a sense of humility about what we can really know, because there are people's lives at the end of it. Being unsure about your gender does not make you gender dysphoric. Being unsure is part of growing up. It's at its worst in adolescence. I'm a dad. Sometimes I don't know what the heck's going on with me. Like I struggle. I struggle with depression. I work a lot in the ICUs. At those times, I don't know where I'm coming or going. Like I'm broken. That doesn't make me gender dysphoric. There are people that have specific triggers for gender dysphoria or that can look like gender dysphoria. If you're having these events, same-sex attracted, depression, anxiety, they need to be dealt with. If you've been abused as a girl, you don't want to be a girl anymore. You want to dress like a boy because then boys don't get harassed. When you're going through puberty and you're starting to develop breasts and everybody's whistling at you and going on, boys don't have that, so I want to hide away. That's why the recommendations is that you don't even talk about doing transition in the, in the um, presence of abuse. So I've said, what are you? And I want to ask you, who are you? And where do you find your value? What makes you important? In my life, what has made my value is that I was a nerd. If you think it's cool, not cool to be a nerd at school, when you go to university and you start hitting the top marks, people go and like, wow, that made me feel awesome. And then I went on and became a doctor, and then I subspecialized, then did a PhD. And every time I publish a paper, I feel better and better about myself. But I build myself and my value in what I do. And one day, God took all of that away from me, and I sat there and I had nothing. In fact, I got everything that I wanted in life, and I got to the point where I tried to commit suicide. I got every single thing that I wanted. Research stuff, scholarships, beautiful wife in the international country, and I had nothing because I'd built the value around me. I, at that moment, sitting in the pigsty, realized that I've got what I wanted. I got what I wanted, I got all of it about me. And at that moment, at the lowest point of my life, I realized I needed somebody to save me. I needed a savior, I needed Jesus. And Jesus said to him, come to me, all you are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Trying to do this on your own, be cool, be somebody important, is a terrible burden to carry. Jesus says, therefore, any, or Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old Ratzer, and still a little bit now today, loves the fact that he did so well and tries to hide all his value in what he achieved. But the new creation knows that Jesus Christ and God is my creator, gives me value that doesn't matter what happens to me, even if all my hair falls out like it is, I'm still valuable in him. God sent Jesus to buy freedom for us, so that we who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, so we can call Abba Father. 
You are no longer a slave to this world, to this culture, to your gender, to your work, to your achievements. You are a child of God. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've been asked, can I explain the word dysphoria? Dysphoria is the opposite of euphoria. Euphoria is the feeling that you get when you win the lotto. Or when that girl looks at you or that guy looks at you. Or it's a sense of extreme joy, fulfillment, happiness, euphoric. Dys means the opposite of that. So it's a sense of unhappiness, deep unease. It persists everything all the time is the sense of just not lacquer. People with gender dysphoria, persistent gender dysphoria, this thing dominates their life. It is hugely harmful for them. They come to psychiatrists and psychologists because their lives are falling apart. They commit suicide because they are never feeling comfortable and happy with themselves. It's a devastating thing that just goes through everything. So, um, so that's, the, that's the definition behind the dysphoria. And this is important that I wanted to say is I do not minimize, and we must be careful not to minimize the damage and the difficulty of carrying the burden of gender dysphoria. People with gender dysphoria are struggling. They deserve our compassion. They deserve our love. I'm talking tomorrow about some of these issues and how do we respond? How should the church respond? And the one thing we should not be responding with is with judgment and with some type of superiority. We come as beggars that found bread in Jesus Christ, and we present that in love to others. So when you speak truth, if it's not perfused with the love of Jesus, you're just wasting your time. So we need to be careful and thoughtful about how we talk about that. Our, our children, you know, they go to school, they surrounded by friends that could have gender dysphoria or think it's gender dysphoria, but it's not gender dysphoria it's because of the culture influencing the thought processes because of what you've said. So um, what is the kind of approach that you should have and, and the children should have if they realize they have a friend that's in the situation where they are not happy with the gender that they have? So, so where should they go? Because I think the children want to know. Who, do, who must they go and talk to? What, what's the process? Well, both. <laughs> it's the same response that you would have to somebody that's struggling with alcoholism. The issue in this person's life is not their dysphoria. The issue is Jesus. And it's like if somebody says they're gay. The issue is not the fact that they're gay. The issue at its core is, do I have a relationship with Jesus? Once you understand who Jesus is and you understand your identity in Jesus, then you start dealing with all the other issues. You don't come to Jesus when you've got all the things ticked off. So I, our church, our culture, particularly the church, has done really badly with dealing with homosexuality, same-sex attractions, transgender issues, because we keep focusing on what I call the sin. That's what it's about, but it's not about it. It's about the relationship that you have. So in the same way as you would deal with any other problem, I'm going to be teaching and training my children to love the person, speak the truth in love, and continue to build a relationship and witness them to the truth of Jesus. What is the response in your own home? I talk to my son who's six about the reality of who he is. Can, I, can he change his gender? No, he can't change his gender. He can't change his sex. You can give him hormones and testosterone and do all types of stuff on him to make him look different, but you can't change who he is. So philosophically, I'm already trying to teach him the thing that reality is real. If you can't trust reality, you can't trust anything. And then talking about the issue of compassion, those that are struggling that we open our hearts to them because we could be in that scenario. How do you deal with it if your child or somebody goes through, through this process? 
the first thing is to realize that these kids over here in three to five years are going to be at university and they will do what they want. You have seven, about the time of the child hits 13, 14, they are starting to make up their own mind. You've laid the foundation. The second phase of childhood is they start to ask questions. They will ask the questions. If your household doesn't provide the opportunity to ask the questions and answer the questions, they'll get the answer somewhere else. So they need to understand for themselves. We have the privilege of being able to chaperone them and talk them through it. So the wrong response, I think, is say, this is wrong, no. Because they will go and do it anyway, because they will become, God allows us to choose him or to reject him. The ultimate God creator allows some people to say no to him. That is the degree of freedom that he allows it. The child in your home, within limits, must be able to express and talk about and think about who they really are. And your opportunity is to model that and to talk about it. And then you need to understand why this trigger. Statistically, it is unlikely to be gender dysphoric. Now, dysphoria. Now, the proponents of this will say, I'm totally wrong and the incidence is really different. But children and teenagers are not just gender. They are peers and there's a life trauma event, somebody died, or somebody's been abused, or I've got severe depression, I've got severe anxiety, those things will then be expressed as, and you as a parent need to explore, why is that happening? The easy answer, in my mind, is to go and just medicalize the issue and turn it into a medical issue. And I've got contact with um, some psychiatrists, psychologists in, in, um, in Australia that argue this point exactly. If it if a child, if a young girl is abused, sexually abused, and comes out and says, I don't want to be a girl anymore, to then go and transition them is to deny the trauma that happened to that child. In fact, the thing that you should be doing is saying, whoa, let's talk about this. Unfortunately, a lot of this discussion is framed inappropriately as you either fully affirmative or you're a homophobic, transphobic bigot. And that's just the absolute caricature of both sides. There are many things that we don't understand. And there are, on the other side, people that are really focused on trying to, they believe that they're doing well. We need to develop some type of interaction between that. And there's a role for psychiatrists and psychologists and Christian psychologists, not to try and convert somebody or to apply conversion therapy, but to deal with people as individuals. The Australian and New Zealand psychiatry boards have put out statements saying that psychotherapy and discussion, talk therapy, is a critical component of dealing with children with gender dysphoria. The answer is not medicalization or transition as the first step. It is a long process of interaction. And the, um, the Tavistock group, the Swedish group, the Finnish group that have gone all before this are saying the same type of thing. And medicine does this. We go like, this is the answer, this is the answer, and then we swing to the middle. Unfortunately, this is happening on top of the whole cultural war. And I know a few transgender people that look at this and go, in this mess that's going around it, me as a transgender person, we're getting lost in this. The true meaning of what to be gender dysphoric, to suffer in this thing, is being trivialized by people saying, I can change my gender overnight. What about the people that are really struggling with it? So the concept is in your home, talk about it. Understand that your child needs, you need to create the space. If your child's not asking questions at home, you're not making space for them to question you and your faith and your belief. You're not, you are, you are losing the ability to engage with your child. So bring that into the home. If you've got Christian children, talk about these issues, but present Jesus to the people. And we, as we're starting to see, there's going to be down the line people that are going to say, we need help. We don't, what happened is, was a mistake. And we need to come to those people with love and humility and talk to them. So we need to have Jesus' mind. You know, he's hanging out with the prostitutes, the lowest inverted commas of the low, the people that everybody excluded. That is where Jesus goes. That's where our churches need to be. You need to be wise, understand the truth. I'll be talking about this tomorrow. But when you talk to somebody, you speak to them in love. I would like to know in the South African context, but in the context of where our church is now, 
as to jong mense is wat gender dysphoria het, wat ouders gewoonlik sal doen, is seker in my ons so kind na seelkundige toe te neem, wat is op die oomlik, in, in, op, soos, op die tijd, hoe sien die medische professie dit, en wat is die protokolle en die wetenskap wat onderskryf word, en wat die regering ondersteun? So, uh, this is the heart of the argument or the discussion, exactly what you've asked. The first thing to say is the government cannot and does not uh, mandate treatment of anybody. They, they can't do it. It's not how we're structured in South Africa. Doctors have autonomy to practice medicine within the bounds of what is acceptable practice. Second thing is that South Africans above the age of majority have full autonomy around their bodies within certain limits. If you want to have surgery, you can have the surgery. And I think because we're in a free society, I support that. There's also not a role for me to get involved and try to break up the relationship between a doctor and a patient. So that's just as a framework, as a starting point. The big debate internationally, although some will now say there is no debate on that, is do you follow what's called an affirmative pathway? or do you follow a watch and see protocol? That is also a caricature. It's not that easy, it's not just one or two. And that's what the Finnish and the Swedish and the UK and the French are going down now. They're saying this thing of, I just affirm, there seems to be an issue with this because we're missing a whole lot of other issues. And just ignoring it on the other hand doesn't seem to work either. So what causes the least potential harm in the long term is the question. So that's where the discussion is. There are guidelines called the WPATH guidelines, which have been put out internationally. They're not put out by a, a government body. It's a group with, of experts and interested parties that have come together and created a guideline. It reflects largely the literature around this. But if you look at their guidelines versus what the Finnish have said, now the Finnish are a government body, they don't have a stake in this. They know that they want to do the best for their countries. They say, we need to be careful, we need to slow down. The Swedish have said, we need to be careful, we need to slow down. The French have put out a warning around this. The UK has now put around a warning around this. The Australians and the New Zealanders have said, psychotherapy is an important part of this. If this is presented as being a cut and dried argument or treatment pathway, I think it's a gross misrepresentation of what's really happening. Because why are the French and the Australians and the New Zealanders and the Finnish and the Swedish and the UK then lying to everybody? And what do they gain from it? They're not transitioning anymore. So there's a lot of uncertainty around it. I do not treat patients like this. I do not um, have deep insight into that at all. What I do know is that the medical science behind hormone blockers and surgery and the consequences and the benefit of that is deeply poor evidence research that needs to be taken with a huge amount of caution. You, if you want to do it and you're adults and you and your, or you and your parents decide that, you have the right to do that. And that's South Africa. You can choose. We have the freedom of choice. You can do it. I've written a letter urging caution to the medical community to do it based on, I've just quoted what the other people have said. So around people struggling in terms of the emotional, I think there's a big difference between the classic gender dysphoric patients, teenagers, and then the subcategory of children that are going through autism or there's an abuse component or depression, those type of things. And they cannot be treated in the same way. And I think it's to disrespect the unity of the individual to think that just the random, uh, or the standard affirmation unthinkingly approach is the way to go. I'm not saying the clinicians who are transitioning people in South Africa are just transitioning them and not trying to step through those processes. Um, but that is where the argument is. It's seen the most polarized in the US because there is no central authority. There's no national health system. Same in South Africa. If you're in private, you only report to the health professionals councils around um, unethical behavior, not around clinical mandates. So there's no oversight process on it. 
But where there is oversight process in the national health systems, there's been a warning put onto it and says, if we're going to do this stuff, it needs to be done in the context of a clinical trial. The Dutch, we don't know what's happening here. This is a new thing. So the answer is to that question is that this is the core of the discussion, is we're not really sure what to do. Um, so if someone, like let's say you know someone who says that they're transgender and let's say this person is a female biologically but they say that, oh no, I want to be referred as a he. How do you go by like with the whole pronouns and labels things? How do you go about that as a Christian person knowing what we know now and going forward with that? Okay, so the first thing to, I would ask is like, what are we trying to achieve? What is our long-term goal as a Christian? The long-term goal is to glorify God, to have people live good lives. And a good life is knowing God, living within his instructions, thriving. So your aim is to show this person Jesus Christ. Your aim here is to provide comfort and love to that individual. Because for somebody to have gone through that process, they don't just wake up in the morning and decide they want to have this thing. There's been something that has happened in their life. Even if they are a gender dysphoric, they're a human created in the image of God. They deserve to be loved and respected. So what do I do? First thing to say is when you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a person, you never refer them as he or she. Like if I'm talking to John, I say, hello, John, how are you? I never talk about them in the he or she person. I call them on their name. Second thing is when I introduce myself as Reitzer, you didn't decide that that was a boy or a girl's name. It's just this person is called Reitzer. You get people called Andy. It can be both girls and boys. So the fact that that person changes their name, my approach has been when I've talked to people like that, I call them on the name that they would want to be called. I refer to them as John or Mary or wherever they are. What are you trying to achieve by telling them, by using a name that they no longer want to call themselves? If they went and legally changed their name, to a gender neutral name, you would call them on that name because they changed the name. So some of this stuff is, and then I get asked often, well, aren't you as a Christian supporting a lie in doing this? Well, I've spoken to transgender women who I didn't know was a woman, was a biological man who transitioned to be a girl. I, she looked like a girl. So now, am I going to go and check to see, well, are you a boy or are you a girl? And then I'm going to, no, that's not how we work. So my approach to them is to respect the person. If somebody comes out in your environment, in the church environment, and says they're homosexual, same-sex attracted, is the approach to correct them and fix their problem, or is the approach to talk to them about Jesus? If somebody comes out and says, I am an alcoholic, if somebody comes out and says, I've got a porn addiction, you say, well, you need to sort out your problem first. No. The issue for a Christian is the heart. It's talking to them in love, and you can only talk in love to somebody that you know and with respect. So you build a relationship and you show them Jesus. Once you've changed the heart, then you start to work out what does that mean. And if you look at Christian literature around transgender people who become Christians, the majority of them stop using transgender hormones. They return back to their base biological sex. If they've had surgery, they don't have surgery again. Many of them continue to struggle with gender dysphoria. They feel uncomfortable, but they are not gender dysphoric in their mind anymore. I'm not a homosexual, or I'm not a transgender person, or I'm not an academic, or I'm not a, I am a child of God, and then I've got these issues. And we all have to carry the cross. I have this major issue with depression. I'm not a depressive. I'm a racer. I'm a Christian. I'm a new child of God. I struggle with depression. It's my cross that I have to bear. Maybe you've got anxiety disorders, or eating disorder, or just insecurities, and maybe you're super arrogant. That's what you're going to have to deal with. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. And we all have to pick it up. So your aim here is not to try and convince her. Your aim is not to try and, you know, change the, um, you know, fix this thing. Your aim there is to talk to her out of love. If the school or your work organization mandates that you must speak in a certain way and you choose not to do that, you should not, you must speak the way that you want to speak. The government cannot mandate speech. So if they say to you, we'll kick you out of class if you don't call her a she, 
and you feel that you don't want to call her a she and you call her a he, and they kick you out of class, then we need to go to court on that. Because as much as they have the right, we have the right to have any surgery we want, so I have the right to speak, to say what is. So if I think that this, in a scenario like this, I, that's why I've put it up in the front. A transgender, a boy who transitions to become a girl does not become a girl. A person is a transgender uh, girl, and he's still a biological male because you can't change the genetics. So one-on-one, -on -one, the relationship is about this person and the love that we need to show to them. When we start to step out to a broader thing, it's about how do we share the space in the community? Because we all need to live in South Africa and share the commonality of it. So we need rules that allow space for everybody. Nobody should be harassed. Nobody should be bullied. We should be treated with respect. No matter what you want to do, as long as it doesn't infringe on the rights of other people. But you cannot mandate me to speak or not to speak. You've seen me put that stuff on the beginning because I'm getting pressure not to speak. Because by me speaking about these things, I'm causing harm to other people. But if I'm speaking the truth, then this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. If the truth is the truth, then it should, it is the truth. That's what it is. I'm not going to change the truth around it just because somebody else is affronted by what it is. If I presented false or incorrect information, come and talk to me. As a Christian, I have the religious right to state a point. Philosophically, I can state the points as long as they don't undermine the humanity and the worth of every person. And this is a battle that we need to fight with love. Um, we don't need to go down the U.S. route where we're at each other's throats and trying to kill each other. If the church is wise in how we deal with this and shows the love of Christ, there's an opportunity for us to move through this and really build something. How's that for a long answer to a question, eh?